All right. So, uh, everyone, welcome to the second annual global Osmocosm conference. We are delighted to have you here. We have a lot of people to thank for uh, this event. This is our first time doing it in person as well as on Zoom. Last year was, of course, the pandemic. And uh, the Osmocosm conference is about the world of molecules around us, but the world that we can sense through our sense of scent and the power that that uh, understanding can bring to humanity. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank the co-organizers of this event. This is a labor of love by everyone involved. Everyone is a volunteer, and we're supported by very generous donations by leaders in the field, such as Aromix, who are here represented by Dr. Ilya Kolb, who will uh, give a speech later. And uh, they're involved in the olfactory and uh, flavor sciences by expressing cells with olfactory receptors on them. We also have fantastic sponsorships by Tunable, which is a company that has created a device that can smell greenhouse gases and other gases with a very large micron size, uh, several micron sized infrared window. And they actually have brought their prototype here. They will talk about it and we can actually also see it. We're also sponsored by Bowman's and Togas and the University of Pretoria to bring here students from other countries who want to participate in the olfaction technology uh, conference as well as the moot court competition where we're going to have two teams argue a moot case that hasn't happened yet in front of actual judges and discuss the laws around olfactory technologies. So I want to thank the organizing committee who you will find here in various forms, but uh, they are, and please raise your hands so people can see who you are, Karolina Sulich here, our vice president, Dimitri Ioannidis, who just disappeared somewhere, but he's here, uh, Nikhil uh, Lyle, who's also here, Taras Cutter, M. Doherty, Mia uh, Bonardi, Chris Rose, Michael Benson, and Lyndon Gladhill. These are the co-founders and uh, are the co-organizers of this, and I'm eternally thankful to them. They've put their love, their energy, their time into this thing to make it a success for all of us. So, um, to tell you a little bit about how this uh, Osmocosm idea came about, I want to very quickly give you a, a whirlwind tour of my presence here at MIT. For the last 18 years, I've been researching olfactory technologies, and uh, the Osmocosm Public Benefit Foundation is a 501c3 Massachusetts registered charity, and our mission is to elevate all boats olfaction, whether you're a technologist, an artist, a designer, a scientist, an entrepreneur, a financier, or a lawyer who is interested in the future that where we can smell each other just as well as we can see each other, and all the AI and other technologies that will come to bear, including all the sensors that uh, Professor Paradiso will talk to us about in a minute. If you want to be ahead of what's going to happen, we need to also understand the legal framework. So that's why we have this moot court competition, which is uh, Dimitri's idea and a fantastic um, event. So my lab has been uh, uh, sort of, it changed direction abruptly when in 2004, I read a, rather uh, for me, it was more like 2005, but in 2004, there was a paper that was published in the British Medical Journal that showed that a trained dog could do better at diagnosing bladder cancer than any hospital test, both earlier and more accurately. And it could also generalize. After being trained on urine from bladder cancer, it could generalize to other cancers that did not have any identical volatiles. That shook me to my core. It meant that the dog can do something that no analytical test can do, and it can outdo all hospitals. Uh, it shook me to my core because it meant that there is something out there that is very big, very powerful, very uh, available if you have the right sensors, but currently the right sensors are buried inside of dog and other animals. If we could make this technology available to our cell phones, smartphones, sensors, IoT, uh, connected devices, et cetera, the world suddenly starts looking very different. So to that end, much research has gone into uh, other uh, projects that always feed into back into olfaction. And you'll see this with this conference. We have people that are going to talk also about uh, things that are peripheral to olfaction or at first glance even not related at all. But in, uh, in my experience, it's very keenly related because they've all been part of the same ecosystem. And people are seeing now that integration of directions of research is important. So this is a, an overview of the work that has been happening uh, in my group that I call the MIT Label Free Research Group. And as you see, I've done, made this slide so, so that there's no boundaries. This is to terrify the academics, because uh, in academia we love defining nature by chemistry, biology, physics, and having boundaries between those fields, but in reality nature is not like this. It's all a big one. So we've done things such as create biosolar photovoltaics, which means uh, stabilizing uh, photosynthetic proteins 
uh, on electronic circuits. You'd think that that has nothing to do with noses, but in fact, the technology that went into stabilizing photosystem one is the same technology that goes into stabilizing olfactory receptors on top of field effect transistors. So in one case, we're making nanoforks, which means we can make solar power out of grass clippings. With the same technology, we make electronic noses. In both cases, we have a stabilized bio component that is sitting there sort of alive doing the work for you. In uh, many other things uh, that we've done, including uh, uh, generating energy and sensing uh, fires directly out of trees, uh, whole genome transplantation, uh, 3D printing of lattices where we can uh, put stem cells, including olfactory stem cells on, uh, creating the world's first practical and wearable pain detector, many other things. So people always ask me, what does your group specialize in? Well, we do specialize, and we specialize in not. That means not specializing. It is actually quite hard. The instinct, as soon as you master something, is to keep doing more and more of it and uh, to learn to stop uh, doing more and more of the same thing and force yourself to learn something new takes some effort. So uh, um, one of the th uh, many, many things that are coming out of here is this is work by uh, a previous postdoc that uh, uh, I had who was, again, a pluripotent individual like many of us here. He didn't do just one thing. Philippe Osterlamousis created a 3D printer for stem cells. And nowadays, you know, you can rip off your entire olfactory epithelium, your own olfactory epithelium, and be able to raise those cells instead of, inside of matrices uh, into various organs. That is where the research is going. So that is how the connection to olfaction is there. Here, as you can see, a trained dog that has been trained to diagnose uh, prostate cancer from urine um, uh, being tested. So the third vial, I don't even have to tell you, you'll see it's quite obvious. The third vial is the one that comes with urine from a person suffering from prostate cancer. The dog picks it up, no problem. And we have the GCMS to show it. This became a company called Sentient, and the CEO of this company will speak at this conference um, later this week. Uh, we sent uh, a rocket into, uh, into low orbit uh, to create drugs in space, and as far as I know, we were the first ones to do it. And we have, uh, of course, the, the, the trained dogs that can detect disease has been a very big story. Those were the inspirations to building noses such as this one, which is about the size of this podium. Um, and this was built for, the, uh, for DARPA, for the United States government. Uh, and then uh, over the years, we've shrunk this, smaller and smaller it gets, and now it can actually fit in your cell phone. This is the last slide I will show, and I want you to pay attention to this as it's looping around. This is an artist's impression of what I think a dog basically sees with their nose. As you're walking around, you're leaving behind you on where you step behind you like a trail, like a, like a wedding gown, you're leaving a trail of molecules that can be mined for information that is absolutely essential to understanding your physical and mental health state. As you also breathe out, this was not shown in this uh, very well. Here, you can kind of see it a little bit on the bottom one. There's also a big plume uh, ahead of you, which has to do with your breath. The amount of information that is mineable out of those two signals, the, the, the trail of molecules you leave behind that are just shedded out of your body naturally, and also the, the exhaled molecules, is incredible. So imagine being able to diagnose disease, physical, mental health states, et cetera, including things that are very, very sensitive. Everybody probably agrees that it's a good idea to be able to just diagnose COVID or other such airborne pandemics so that we can define the boundaries, we can respond quickly, we can see if an intervention is working, things like that. If everybody has a cell phone that can tell you whether you or someone you pointed to has COVID, that sounds like we can live with it. That sounds like a good idea. How about instead of COVID, it's now cancer or Parkinson's? Uh, it starts getting very iffy. What if it's epilepsy or, uh, or diabetic shock uh, warning? Oh, now it's really great, we really want this. What if it's pregnancy, now that we've almost criminalized unwanted pregnancies? Uh, what if now somebody can point a phone at you and know if you're pregnant, what sex you're carrying, who the dad is? Things like this are available to the noses that are trained out there. That world is coming, and to get ahead of it, we are looking into the laws, the, the litigators, the legislators, the lawmakers, the professors, and we have actual judges coming here to adjudicate a, a competition that will get us closer to understanding what does this future look like for us and what can we do. Uh, I will finish with this. This is a famous quote by Alexander Graham Bell, who said, if you want to find a new science, measure a smell. I used to battle this quote a lot. I used to say that, no, 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 this is not, not nonsense. The smell is easier. You don't need a new science. Then I went back saying, oh my God, smell is compl a complete mystery. It does need a new science, and now I'm somewhere in between. We definitely have holes in our understanding of action, but it's getting there. It's the fastest growing field of neuroscience, which might be the fastest growing field of science, apart from data science, if you think that's something. Uh, and just as a test for me, raise your hand if you know what that is. Yes, only the people who are <laughs> old enough to know what that is. How about now? <laughs> okay, <laughs> of course. Now, uh, with this, I finish my uh, uh, little spiel, and I want to introduce uh, Professor Joe Paradiso, here.
yes, who runs the responsive environment uh, group here at the MIT Media Lab. And uh, uh, I want you to really pay attention to, to our keynote speaker here today, Professor Paradiso, as a pluripotent person who, who crosses field boundaries and does fantastic work. He started off as a physicist, worked at CERN, and created this uh, idea of that the environment itself can be responsive with distributed sensing, and that this can affect how you behave. This can mind your uh, own behavior for information that can affect your behavior directly or via feedback networks. And uh, it augments and mediates perhaps your mood if you can know what the environment is doing. The networking of these sensors is really truly key. Think about it how you're sensing in your body. You have olfaction, you have vision, you have other senses. They're all networked together. And from the fusion of these sensory data, you can get a lot more than even if you had more of the same over and over. Uh, I consider him to be uh, one of the world's uh, leading perception engineers. It's a new term that we, we, we claim to have, uh, at least on Twitter, we're the first ones to ever use it in my group. But perceptual engineering is just that. It's trying to engineer your perception, engineer with your perception, and engineer for your perception. So with this, please uh, uh, help me welcome Professor Joe Paradiso and his responsive environments uh, work uh, that he will talk about, about us today. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again, Andrea. It's amazing that you were in that class. I, I didn't realize that, oh, yeah. that you were there. Yeah, they want. I'm thinking about teaching part two. I ran out of time in that one, but uh, we'll see. Uh, anyway, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, some, a bit about, I'll try to weave olfaction into most of what I'm saying. We don't really do olfaction. We're not a smell group. We're a sensors group. We're an IoT group. Uh, we look at how all this information comes up to people in different ways. Uh, and. I think there's a tremendous frontier for, for olfaction on both avenues. We've explored a little bit, but I'm going to give a lot of suggestions, I think, as to, as to where it can be leveraged in, in different ways. Um, starting at a, at a high level, you know, and I was thinking about this when I was preparing the talk, what really is olfaction? Andres and I talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, it can mean a lot of things, and I think uh, in, in a lot of the material and, and things that are going to be talked about, you'll explore lots of it is it really the nature of airborne molecules? I think in the pure sense, that's kind of what it is. But let's go beyond that, right? Uh, other media, water. Is there some, does sharks smell? In some sense, they do. Is it taste? Is it smell? Are they both versions of the same thing? They kind of are. Uh, how about in a vacuum? I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, we have a lot of space-based uh, uh, experiments we're doing now, and one of them I actually would like to smell in a vacuum, because when you get micrometeorite impacts, you have a, a plume, a gas plume, a plasma plume. You could smell it. Um, that intrigues me. Uh, and then you, you talked a little about the, the neural connection. There'd be a lot of that. That's so deep in smell. It's so fundamental. It's like seeing is not just pixels. It, you know, we have so many things that we do down the visual pipeline as we process images. Smell is so deeply effective, so deeply affects memory, so deeply affects the brain. It, there's a whole symphony in, in a smell. It's not just a chemical compound, right? And people are starting to unpack that, unwind it, and, and, and explore it more. So that's, that's a whole other, whole other thing, and one that's of real interest to us. Um, and then there's olfactory output. And a lot of progress happens. I'm sure you'll talk about that here. Um, I've been to, to smell museums. There's one in Linz, actually, in Austria that I visited. And the amount of infrastructure it takes to purge the air for an audience and have smell choreographed with video. And of course, there's no true basis for most of this. There kind of is, but it does it always work. This is a question you guys could answer better than me. But they had probably 50 or 60 uh, bottles of scent that they were pumping in and pumping out. So uh, massive infrastructure. smell around, smell, smell vision I got a, a holiday in Spain, right? That was the first smell vision movie, I think. It didn't come with any odor. It was a DVD. We don't have that at home yet. But in the theater, you, you would have different smells. Uh, scratch and sniff we all know about. Uh, so large scale, yes, yeah, complicated. Personal scent is coming, but it's a very limited palette. Uh, you know, leakage isolation. Although I, I was at a wearable conference just recently, it's amazing what people are doing with wearable scent integrated into things like glasses, but it's, it's just starting. There's more to do. Uh, and of course, when we have AR and VR, different user interfaces, does dynamic scent play a role? You hear a bit more about that with Patty, uh, who's done more work there. We've played with it, and uh, I think that's a really exciting frontier. In a way, it's kind of key to the title of my talk. Um, I don't know. There we go. Uh, this work is, uh, I'm going to go very, very quickly. It's not much time. I'm going to go quickly through a lot of projects in my group. I've got a great group of students from uh, all over the world that, that, that come to work with me. So uh, I'm fortunate to, 
uh, have them work hard. So, you know, the stuff you're about to see is, is really the product of, of, of a lot of hard work by this, this gifted crew that I've, I'm fortunate to have here. Um, the work on my group is, is across scales. So we look at sensing people, we look at it with wearables, we look at uh, sensing buildings and infrastructure, we look at landscapes more and more, and we've got projects in space. So I'm going to give you kind of a quick taste across that very fast. Uh, and uh, a little bit of bio, usually I talk a bit more about this, it's not much time, but I've been building sensors for a long time. I uh, even had a little sense of taste there. It was an electrochemical probe with a meter. That was me in middle school here at the Southern Junior High School in Somerville. I grew up actually right down the street. Southern is gone now, during the first space age. Um, so I've been doing sensors for a while, and uh, I love music, as Andreas said. I usually have a whole thing about you know, how I build synthesizers and stuff, but I'm not going to talk about that here. Uh, but again, music is audio affecting you like smell. For me, sound quality of a space is almost like a scent. Uh, and anybody who is deep into music, we feel it that way. So I think uh, the brain's leverage in, in this perception is, is really critical in, in the experience of being human. Um, this is one of the first things that we did that looked at air quality. It's a wearable air quality monitor we built actually for uh, the Italian energy company ENEL. They were refurbishing nuclear power plants in Europe. Uh, that the Soviets had built, and they had construction crews working in these uh, hazardous environments because of dust, volatiles, gases, welding, all these other things. So we built way back in, uh, I don't know if there's a date here, but it's, uh, yeah, mid-2000s, 2012 we published it. It's a wearable uh, sensor, has gas sensors of various sorts of volatiles. Uh, uh, it's uh, got an ozone sensor. It's got a Particulate matter sensors, kind of a smoke alarm, very crude compared to what people do now. It's still not quite fully wearable, right, but people made enormous progress. And then we had uh, base station units, and we'd put it on workers and try to get some idea of the dose they were accumulating already back then. So we're kind of smelling a few specific examples of, of hazardous uh, things in the air. And this is a video that we made. Uh, we were looking at annotating the video with the sensor data. So you can see the plots below. Uh, you look at the volatiles uh, in the ozone change the color from yellow to blue, and we measure height with a pressure sensor. If he's too high for a safety violation, we turn to red. We can focus on the workers. You can see one is more yellow, one is more blue. There's more volatiles in one case, uh, more ozone in the other. You don't want a welder to go near a painter, right? So this is the kind of thing you want to flag. And we're trying to bring that scent of smell, for example, right, out in, in the video. Uh, this is something we're building now. It's uh, a wearable system to really try to get some idea of the internal state of a, of a user. So, uh, you know, we have a set of glasses that don't necessarily focus out with sensing, they focus in. So we're trying to get some idea of cognitive load, for example. We uh, have temperature sensors at the temple and at the nose. We can look at the difference that has some indication for cognitive load. We look at how the head moves with IMUs. We look at eye dynamics with sensors. We combine all of that and build them right into the glasses. Uh, so it's a list of all the sensors. We can track people in, in a room if it has any infrastructure as well with it, so on and so forth. Um, my students got really good at building electronics for this. They, they actually embedded in Shenzhen with a company that makes glasses to learn about how to, how to do these things. Uh, and yeah, the, the data is looking good. We have some indication that we could get some idea of cognitive load. There are more tests that are happening now. But we decided to go further and add sensors for air quality onto it too. So you know, put them near where you breathe, right? And you can, they're so small, these basic sensors, you can see the ones that we're adding here. Uh, we can just put them there and get some idea of how that affects comfort. So we're looking at visualizations. The uh, air quality, you can't see it as well here, but that's the smoke in the air. So that's the, uh, the color of the smoke. The density of the smoke is the air quality. And the cognitive load is, is going to be reflected in the color of the brain. <laughs> so we can kind of look at the data with, with visualization. I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. Uh, and we have apps that we're building to try to uh, enable people to tag their comfort with, uh, with the sensor values, so we can start to learn. Uh, and we're doing it all over. It's collaboration with the University of Freeborg. I have a student in my group now, and we plan to run tests in, in different, different places around the world to get some idea of different settings, how people uh, think about comfort versus how the, the glasses infer them with data. Uh, this is the spacecraft uh, device. It was an IEEE Spectrum uh, uh, last December. Uh, this is Juliana, one of the students in my group. She made what we call space skin by embedding piezoelectric fibers into uh, beta cloth, a cloth that wraps spacecraft for thermal management and for protection, because they're always getting pelted by micrometeorites, right? Space has got many hazards, and that's one of them. Uh, can we measure the impacts? And indeed, it turns out we can. She's you know, demonstrated that, that these fibers, we're using actually fibers, some commercial ones, but also fibers made by Joel Fink's lab here at MIT. He's an expert in 
putting things into pulp fibers. And uh, yeah, we can measure the impacts, we can characterize you know, the strength of the impacts, so on and so forth, locate it. Uh, the question that I ask is can we d determine the nature of what hits you? Right, something about it. So we're looking at plasma discharge because you have a plasma wake and you analyze the plasma somehow to get an idea. But heck, there's a plume, right? This thing hits, there's gas that's made. Can you smell it somehow? Uh, we we're talking at one point about the, uh, the, the, the uh, resistive biosensors. Can you integrate that into a fabric? Would it survive in space? Could it capture enough of the plume and change in a measurable way? So you can say something. Is it metal? Is it paint? Is it uh, some uh, part of an asteroid, you know, a silicate? Uh, even that would be interesting. And can we do it in the fabric? Is there a way to smell somehow out there? Um, and then uh, finally, we, we also look at putting sensors out into the wild. This is at Tidmarsh, uh, large cranberry farm in Southern Mass. We took over, we built a sensor to measure lots of things. Uh, we put it in the ground. It, 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 because of the wetlands, become a restored wetland, we can measure conductivity, we measure pH now, we, we measure lots of things, kind of tasting the ground, right, and then other things. Uh, we got them all over the place. So we're really looking at what happens to the hydration and to the environment around uh, so deployment of a transect. Uh, again, the hydro, we go into holes <laughs> with the sensors, it's very expandable. We can have more or less anything to these. Temperature over a year, this is hydration, you can see the effects of rainfall, so on and so forth. Uh, but yeah, can you start thinking about adding other things? Audio, for sure we do. Audio is a little bit like scent. Stuff uh, basically propagates through the air and you can hear it, you can detect different kinds of wildlife. Uh, in the days before eBird, we, uh, we uh, were doing classification of bird species with, with the audio there. We can now locate them. This is a day you can see different kinds of animals, birds, frogs, so on and so forth coming in, crickets at different times. Uh, this is different species of birds drilling down. This is data, we, this is stuff we did years ago. Uh, and then we can see different species. We have years of data. So this is changes in the populations of geese and, and uh, chickadees. So you can see the, something about the dynamics. Uh, this is cicadas. So you can see there's a big brood that hatched this year, less the other years. So already uh, audio can tell you a lot. This is scratching the surface of, of, of what we can do. Uh, but what if you can go deeper, right? See something about the microbial life. And uh, uh, we we're talking with my colleague Tom Zimmerman over at IBM Almaden about little microscopes that uh, can basically uh, image microbial life right away. If you can flow through and not biofile, you could start to do machine recognition on this. But why not do something closer to finding the DNA itself? I think that's the future of environmental sensing. It's not just to measure environmental parameters, but to actually measure the DNA that's coming at you through the air, through the water, and get some idea of what's there. Certainly DARPA gets this very much for hazards, but I think just quantifying uh, any kind of ecosystem, it's gonna be important. So uh, one of my students, uh, Devorah Najjar, has been working with uh, the Collins Group here uh, to make uh, uh, really DNA sensors. COVID distracted them, so they made an assay to, for rapid detection directly of COVID. Uh, but she's got an electrochemical sensor and she's talked about making a version, <coughs> sorry, that's renewable where you can flow through it and uh, look for, in this case it's, it's SNPs, particular kinds of DNA that could be in the environment to tell you something about what's there. Uh, so yeah, can you add scent to Tidmarsh, essentially. Uh, I mentioned, uh, for me, sound is like scent, and one of my uh, uh, visitors, actually, is a professor at TU Denmark in acoustics, is come up with ways to characterize acoustic spaces through reverberation, right? That's kind of the scent of a space. He can start backing out architectural parameters from that. It's a frontier, but he's got some great new ideas of how to do that. Uh, and then lastly, how do you represent it? Can you, how do you tunnel all this information into people? This is another frontier. Uh, indeed, we did a lot of that with uh, projects at Tim Marsh. We had all the sensors and then Doppelab here in this building. Uh, this is kind of digital twin done around 2010, 2014 before we called it that. Um, so you can see uh, the sensors animated in different ways. In the building, you can see uh, Tib Marsh, you know, what happens to the weather changes, the virtual world, the sensor data we show in different ways. Uh, so you can get very creative here. I think artists will bring this world of sensing up close to people. We're gonna perceive it that way. This is a version of Tib Marsh that uh, was done by a student looking at uh, carbon exchange. So this is looking at what happens in the air. We weren't measuring air, measuring other things. She built a model to infer it, and now you're seeing it as, as molecules in the air going up or down. So this is yet a way to maybe try to interpret olfaction, right, if we had it. 
Uh, and finally, what about bringing it up close to people? We've done it with uh, audio. We have microphones all over at Tim Marsh. When you're there, we can locate you. We can measure your head direction with a wearable. We can bring the audio into bone conduction. It's an expanded sense. It's like you're enhanced when you have this there, right? You have superpower hearing. You don't want to take it off. Most things I wear, wearables, I want to take them off after a while. This one, you don't. You're enhanced. Can we do that with smell? You know, standing here, can I, you, Andres alluded to that, can I smell across the room without having to go there? I mean, uh, this is kind of intriguing as we have distributed sensing, we can bring it up to people. Uh, can we actually do it by recreating scent? So it's enhanced somehow. And we've looked at it a little bit in, in trying to bring environments up to people in indoor spaces. This is what we call mediated atmospheres where we uh, could change the lighting, change the display, uh, change the audio. Uh, in correspondence to how you react to a room. So the room changes to keep you focused and restored, changes what it shows, changes how it's lit, changes all of that. Of course, could it change its smell? And we did that in this version. It's a portable version. We did with Steelcase, one of our members of the Media Lab. It had a scent display, we worked with IFF on that. Uh, and then of course it could heat you up, cool you down. It could change the display, change the audio, change the lighting, do all of that. And it was portable. So you could move it essentially anywhere you want. So this is kind of a, portable station that does have olfactory output, at least basic olfactory output. The only problem with this is that when it was in my lab, we have a rug, it would have different scents that would go through. Uh, my, uh, my lab smelled like a moldy jungle after a while because the, uh, the floor just absorbs it all and it takes a while to clear out. So that's the, the frontier, right? Uh, yeah, can you have a scent to be creative? Uh, we talk about bringing into a cluttered space to get ideas. Can you have smells that encourage creativity? This is kind of intriguing. I'm sure you can. Marvin Minsky's living room, most creative place I know. Idea in every corner. Is there a smell that can bring this back? Uh, and this is what I call scalable presence. Taking, uh, as we go more virtual, can we start playing with that, that knob to be totally immersed, to be peripheral, right? My watch is tied to my doorbell and my, my, my Nest system at home. Uh, I get you know, things that are alerted haptically, I can see an image, uh, and I can put on VR and be immersed, right? Is there a continuum in between that we can slide? Old fashioned could be a big part of that because it's a background scent. It can attract your attention, but it's always there. Audio is a little bit like that too. So can we start bringing those together? And that's what my, uh, my student Sam is thinking about, combining all of the sensors to make new ones. Um, you know, can I be tied to an AI intent? Things that don't have any physical counterpart. Can I invent new senses for these kinds of things? And could olfaction be part of it? It's, it's, a, it's a really deep question. Uh, and this is my last slide. I mean, eventually, right, uh, if you look at bringing this information into people, if we have the direct neural connection, that's the frontier, right? We can't think beyond that. That's kind of the singularity in this field. Uh, and, and in this building, as we speak, there are people working on that now for prosthetics, for people that, uh, uh, have different kinds of neural damage, you know, to control limbs or to, you know, get information into eyes and ears, so on and so forth. Uh, it's going to accelerate, it'll expand, we'll get better at it. Not an easy problem, but we're, we're, we're making progress in many, many places. Eventually, this will be an option. We can start tunneling these signals directly into us. Uh, speculative fiction has explored this a lot. What is this world going to be? I think there's plenty to do before we get there, that's for sure, that's where we are now. Uh, are there ways that we can usher a fuller and richer connection to physical reality? Olfaction is a big part of it because that's how we connect to spaces. It's missing in most of this. Can we bring it in in an interesting way? Uh, what are the interfaces to connect us and how do they scale between immersion and peripheral? Again, olfaction could be important there. Um, and yeah, where does self stop and other begin? Once you have this kind of connection, we're seeing it already with the phone at arm's length. We're emerging group mind. My, my kids are all texting to each other right before they even do anything. They're fundamentally connected. Where's the individual? Where's the group? Can you thrive in both, both domains at the same time? Get to collective intelligence, as Tom Malone here at MIT calls it, instead of a mob mentality. Uh, I think it's intriguing. And talking about social, uh, interaction, smell is a big part of it, and you know, I love music, as Andreas mentioned. I, right off the top of my head, I thought of two of my favorite albums, right? Motorcycle and The Lodge. Uh, smell is on the title, smell of a friend, smell, wearing your smell, right? And if you go to songs, they're all over the place. Human folklore with social interaction, smell is a big part of it. So, uh, yeah, as we become networked, this will, this will be a part of it too, I'm sure. And what kind of new smells can we smell that we have never experienced before? This is intriguing. Thanks. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so very much. So we have uh, mics for the audience, or if you can drop your questions. Hello, mics on, please. For the speaker, I'll do the, the, the first question. 
Uh, please activate these mics for the, for the speakers. So, um, uh, Joe, I wanted to ask, what is the biggest sort of opportunity and the most horrible challenge that you see when, let's say, the distributivity of these sensors starts including olfaction? Are you at all worried about the, the fact that, the, you know, it can be super uh, scary for your privacy, for instance? You're walking by some sensor, you've equipped it with a, uh, with, with a smell device. Mm -hmm. Let's say somebody aggregates all these data, starts mining it, and they figure out there's a signature for some disease or something else, and now they can triangulate it back to you. Are you worried well, at all about that? It's not just smell, that's already hap that's happening. I, matter of fact, I was just reading an article in the Times, an editorial from a bunch of COVID scientists that worked with, uh, with Joe Biden in the beginning, and, and certainly we've done quite a bit to get past quarantine. We're so happy to have vaccines and things like that. But detection is the thing they were talking about, where we need to have the data from the PCR tests immediately go to the government, blah, 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 blah. There's a reason for that. But look what's going on in China, for instance, where this is being used as an excuse to lock people down w without any, any reason, except maybe a political one. Uh, and that's the danger, in a way, that uh, too much data does violate privacy, and you're right, although at a certain amount, it's very important for public health. Where do we find that balance? So it's not already, even before we get to olfaction, we're getting to it now because of things we can measure. If you're measuring sewer data, it's a little bit anonymous until you have the sensor right in your own line. So that's looking at aggregates in buildings or in areas where you learn a lot from that. That's an early warning. That's so important. When you start being able to identify you with a kind of data that could be relevant, could be good for public safety, but on the other hand, it could be used to, you know, clamp down on you without reason. That is not good, right? Do I smell like an insurgent? <laughs> right now, I'd be wearing the right T-shirt, but uh, or may have a tattoo or something, uh, or maybe use a few words. But uh, yeah, could it, something in my smell say something that, that could be inferred with a neural network or a deep learning system? to mean that I'm an undesirable. This is what we have to worry about going forward. And, and smell, it will be part of it, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And also, uh, we know that dogs can tell intent. They can tell whether you're lying to them. Like, even if your body language is fine and you're smiling and your tone is okay, if you're trying to harm them or harm their owners, they can tell this, and we think it's vile faction. So the same person might smell like a terrorist when they're angry right. and like a saint when they're not. I guess, I guess it's the... Uh, the, the, the psychopaths that will <laughs> pass these tests, yep. they don't care. But I, I mean, in, in do, it's sensor fusion too with animals. We have it a bit. It's not just smell, although people hard try to isolate it, but it's also, you know, subtle things about how you move, your voice, stuff like this. Animals just pick up on that really easily. Absolutely. Um, but smell is a big part of it. And yeah, as we start unrolling more intimate details about, you know, about people through smell, we, we want to protect it like everything else. So I, I don't think it's, it's another window into this that we have to deal with, and it's important. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, unless, uh, is there someone with a question here? Uh, no takers. Anybody from the uh, uh, website, you, you can, uh, Carolina might be able to read the questions if people are putting it in the chat. Please put your questions in the chat. We don't see them uh, out here. But I had one comment also that uh, Joe mentioned that you, and this is my first time hearing this, and I'm surprised that I didn't think of it myself, and I'm thank you for putting this in my head, a new scent, a new sense, rather. You decided to put up all the senses that we have, including some that are not, uh, not biological, and you challenged all of us, I think, with thinking about creating a new sense. Ma maybe it's a sense of fusion. Maybe it's an emergent thing that is even more powerful this than just one, one of the most exciting though. things we're talking about in my group now. I've got a student, Sam Chin, who came in, uh, really to think about not so much sensory substitution, but sensory augmentation in different ways. And she lives by it. She's one of these kids that put a magnet in her finger, right? So she can sense ferrous metal, magnetic fields, transformers. Uh, there are people that do that. You can do it in a safe way. I, I, you know, I'm an electronics hacker, but I wouldn't go that far. But she walks the walk. Um, but uh, yeah, when you put these together, these modalities together, right now we don't have the neural connection, but we can you know, certainly play with different modalities and combining them and then people plasticize and train on it. Can you think of a totally new sense to sense some parameter that is important, but uh, uh, yeah, we, we don't have it. And foreground background too. Some things you want to pay attention to, you know, the details like with vision, some things you just want to be aware of. And can you move it back and forth? In, in the awareness and the habituation. Oh yes, there's a, a, Carolina has a question from the web or from yourself? Okay, so. okay good. Okay, this is, uh, hi, um, this is not um, necessarily super olfaction related, but um, I was interested by this uh, term uh, responsive engineer that Andreas mentioned, that you are 
being named by Andreas and responsive uh, engineer. Perception, perception, oh sorry, <laughs> perception <laughs> engineer. So how would you describe the um, ethics of uh, this uh, like uh, profession? It's not a profession, like, but it, a, I, I ethics, love, like, I because I feel it, like, you know, it's a lot of re related to like environment and like creating like this um, um, con conversation, interactive, um, um, relation with the environment, and I think it's very like high, highly ethically charged. I, I love the uh, the term. I've never heard it before. Oh, that's yeah, Andrew's right. term, but it's it's a great one. Responsive engineer is actually intriguing too because that looks at the output <laughs> channel yeah, yeah. as well. So we're a bit of both. Um, and as this stuff becomes more mainstream, more important going forward, yeah, ethics are always going to be a part of it. I think one of the the, the big things that we see is try to make interfaces that enhance rather than detract, right? Uh, so you look at what's happened with social media, this tremendous amount of information that's available to everybody, and just navigating it is tough, and you know, AIs tend to pull us down rat holes, and, and, and you know, our pressure despite default, and so on and so forth, and they don't necessarily lead us to be better than we are. And we're realizing that now, we're trying to do it in ways that are, that are good. And I think with this kind of augmentation, yeah, lift people up with it. Don't try to sink them down. Don't become less than human. Try to see if you can think of something that, that, that we could get to that's great. And okay, that's vague, but that's really what I would like to do. Then you get to the haves and have nots, right? There's a certain group of people that have this sensory enhancement, so they can do more, they're more connected. There are other people that don't have it. Uh, this is a big issue too. This is a huge issue uh, once it, it even becomes maybe genetic or you start modifying the body and you have an elite that uh, the, the, the do this. Joel Harari talks about this a lot, so yeah. on and so forth. Uh, that's concerning in general, right? But I think the trickle down, at least with electronics, is pretty fast. You're talking about five, ten years. The, the, you get the stuff pretty much to everybody. The mobile phones are the greatest example. It'll be wearable soon. So we won't be the only ones in the privileged countries to have it necessarily. It's, it's going, to, going to find a way. But yeah, five, ten years now is a lot of time because it's moving so fast. See, so yeah, I can keep giving you answers and questioning them myself. It's, it's always hard to answer that question. But I think the goal is to try to lift people up. And uh, for instance, our, our wearable hearing, yeah, to be augmented that way was special. It was unique, it was different. It was something that felt good about it. Uh, so I, I feel better about that and doing something that just diminishes you. And, although on the other hand, attention is fragmented. So I guess you're looking at, at reduced attention devices where you're focusing somebody. But that leads to manipulation, because uh, mm. you can propagate it. So yeah, I can talk everywhere about a solution. Oh no, it doesn't work. It's hard, it's tough. Uh, but I'm an optimist in the end. I think there's just so much opportunity that uh, we'll find a way through. Not gonna be trivial. Thank so, you. Uh, uh, can I uh, also challenge Joe with two more things? Uh, if I can have this mic on, that'll be good. Uh, one is uh, that we have uh, Julia Newell here in the audience, can you raise your hand? She has a startup with, for auditory augmentation for people who have, uh, and maybe you, you can uh, talk to Joe, and I wanted to make the connection. The other thing is that one of our co-organizers is Tara Scudder, who was born anosmic. And she has challenged me and the rest of this foundation of ours with a very direct idea. Fix this yeah, for me. Sure. Make me a sensor that I can either put in my head or she, we were discussing this yesterday, she has this fantastic idea of narration of scent. Yeah. With your devices, she can walk through a field and have in her ear a narration of these scents. Yeah. So she starts connecting perhaps colors, perhaps other sensations, and perhaps that wakes her up, her olfactory apparatus. Yeah. The, the brain plasticity that we, we've seen with people who go blind or, or go anosmic halfway through their lives, that they've experienced th that scent before, uh, has shown us that the, the brain tends to overtake that real estate that is not being fed a signal sure. and use it for something else. Yep. Now we're just discovering what uh, Tara's superpowers are and we figured that she has a very good taste, a sense of taste mm -hmm. because uh, flavor is mostly olfaction. Yep. She uses her tongue to understand yep. the, the texture of things. So can we make her a sensor? Or if you cannot make her a sensor that goes into her head right now, can we use some of your distributed technology so she can walk through an environment that's sensitized or sensorized and she can maybe experience some analog or some new sense that will fit in and, and, and take over some of the olfactory signal that she's not experiencing. That's an intriguing idea. Um, you know, for the new senses, we're kind of in that by default. But yeah, if you're looking at sensory substitution, um, you, didn't, you didn't hear it because there was no audio here, but uh, the Tibmarsh stuff 
has music, you've heard it before, has music there. So we built a framework to take the sensor data and turn it into music. Uh, we have three or four different mappings. We made a framework, had different composers offer on top of it. But I think that could be one avenue too, where I mentioned you know, the neural pathways between hearing and smell, they're, they're both very deep. And are there things you can start to hear from olfactory sensing uh, that you could bring into the, the body through, through, through music, through audio? So that's probably how I would do it. You can certainly do it visually too, maybe, but that, it's very literal. You see something, could be a color, it could be a haze, it could be a bit of both. If it gets to be something text or reading, it's not precognitive, you're not gonna have the same experience. Uh, but on the other hand, audio is precognitive, and I think that might be the natural route into it. You know, it's really interesting because with my kind of hearing loss, I have a very rare form of hearing loss, and so I actually went undiagnosed for my first 10 years of life. And, um, but even now, technology is not advanced enough to adequately meet my hear form of hearing loss. Okay. Um, Whoops. Audio issues. Go ahead. Yeah, um, and I don't know if you know anything about hearing aids, um, but hearing aids actually they are unlike glasses in the sense that they they don't actually fix your hearing; they only amp up what you can hear. So, as Tara was talking about the other day, um, her experience with um, the new pills that she was taking, I was thinking about um, if there was another way um, that maybe we could fix this problem for um, people with hearing loss. Maybe there's another way that we can hear, so. I mean, there's so many things that, that can happen, right? Even for music, some people just don't, don't hear the intervals, whatever else, right? But, uh, some people are better at it. You know, some training can help, but you know, there could be some neural thing that happens. What happens in the brain is harder to fix unless you go through a totally different pathway and go synesthetic, that's another possibility. Uh, on the other hand, cochlear implants get better and better. So, uh, and, and maybe we can start going to the auditory cortex as opposed to just the, the nerves in the cochlea. Uh, eventually that may become better, or maybe even a new kind of hearing that we can't even think about yet. All right, that's the intriguing thing. We're going a little further now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, hearing aids, they, they also get more cognitive. Uh, Dan Gager, I, I had a picture of him in one of the slides. He's one of Bose's lead scientists. And, he actually, uh, he's coming to my group as a affiliate. He's retired and Bose, an amazing audio guy. If any of you want to hang out with Dan, let me you know. And uh, he, uh, uh, he lives with the devices he makes. He's older, I think he has some hearing issues, but he has a beam former that only looks straight ahead. And he wears it at, at tables because of cocktail. And he sit down with Dan at a table full of people. He's got those earbuds on. But yeah, he's got it set so it's only looking straight ahead. And Dan made it for himself. Uh, so you can start to play with processing microphones to at least get rid of background, to focus on people, maybe enhance the audio because now with, with neural architectures you can understand it. And, and not just make it text, but make it sound clearer, right? So we're on the verge of all of that. Uh, but to get past that, get into the brain more deeply, that's deeper research, but it's happening too. So I think you go full front. Yeah, very, very interesting. Something that I've noticed in my experience um, just having hearing loss is, you know, I haven't been involved in any of this, but just living, I've noticed that I have been able to very quickly adapt um, to my um, circumstances. And um, even though I might have hearing loss, I've been able to develop other kinds of skills that I feel are necessary. So what that means for the senses, we, we will see. Yeah, yeah. I think people are just wonderful adapting within, you know, certain limits. They still adapt, but yeah, if you have a zone where you can play in other ways, it's remarkable what, what people can do. But yeah, can technology help them? And yeah, hearing aids have a long way to go. And I think they're making progress, so we'll see what happens there. But beyond that, uh, just different ways of getting information into the body. We're at the edge of that, too, and that's going to happen. For sure. It could be instrumental. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I've been getting tinnitus the last, uh, I don't know if it's because I go to too many loud concerts. I think it's because I, I took cold medication. It was after I took the cold medication, NyQuil, I woke up with tinnitus and never quite went away. And no. I've heard this is common, actually. Okay, no more you have to be very careful about it. <laughs> so I'm hearing always this 9 kilohertz, and it's irritating as hell, but I've learned to ignore it. Only way you can, it's in the brain somewhere, in front of you. You've got to learn to ignore it. And I have, but maybe, yeah. The cure to, for tinnitus is the, the, the huge money-making thing that all kinds of fake snake oil things about it. Eventually we'll figure out how to fix that one and I'm, I'm game. <laughs> I'm totally game. Okay. I think we can try something. Okay. Okay.
Are there but any yeah. other questions? Yes, yeah, Mr. Take the <clears throat> Hi, thank you. Um, great presentation. I, I am actually looking at the albums, the LPs you have up there. Mm -hmm. And the question I have <clears throat> is whether or not the sense of smell and the sense of the sound and hearing are more related than other senses we have. I mean, uh, it seems to me that the smell and the sound and are more interrelated than the sense of touch. Is there perhaps a more connectivity because uh, in some of the senses that we have, especially sound and, uh, and it, uh, smell. It's a, it's a great point, and I think you'd have to talk to an evolutionary neurologist if they exist, for people to really look at how these things develop. I mean, smell has got immediate flight or, uh, you know, flight or, what is it, threat or flight or flight or, <laughs> I'm not, not, I can't remember the word. But, yeah, fight or flight, that's it. Um, it's got real connotations. Yeah, I, I do a lot of electronics. I still build electronics. Ever since I made a building electronics, I still do, do stuff with my synthesizer. And even in the group projects, I, I sometimes get my hands in there. I have an alarm that comes when I have the smell of resistor burning. It's just boom. I wake up because something's going to blow on my board, right? Uh, if I smell anything like that, immediately I go out. Now, smell of smoke, yeah, it depends. It could be smoke outside, it could be blah, blah, blah. But the smell of resistor burning, boom, I'm, I'm totally there. Uh, so yeah, we and you, you smell things that mean that are good. You know, flower smells, whatever else, a nice environment. You know, we, we've learned to like those because those are good for us in other ways. So I think, uh, yeah, it's so primal that it's just hardwired into our, you could call it the reptilian brain, whatever it is, right? I don't know what, but it, evolutionary, uh, that, that goes way, way back. And. Uh, I think uh, audio too. These are both remote senses. Or we're sensing things that aren't here. Ta touch is tactile. By the time you get touch, something is right there. And that certainly is a very developed sense. We're just trying to understand how we can start to leverage that in other ways. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, the threat is already there, right? If you bump into something, definitely you move. But otherwise, the reactions are very varied. But smell is an immediate reaction. Hearing, we hear, we, actually we have another project in my group, Cognitive Audio, that where we train devices to hear like people do, to react to sounds like people do. So you have people classify lots of sounds, did deep learning on them, then we can play the sound, or just play any audio. We can start to see the things it picks out and the things people pay attention to. So yeah, you have a siren, you have a, a baby crying, you have someone yelling, we're, we're, we're definitely trained for that. There are other things too that just attract our attention naturally. I see my cats, right? There are certain sounds that don't fit in, right away it comes there, boom, perks up their ears because it's important to them. It means something that could relate to survival or opportunity or whatever else. It could be someone coming home. And uh, it's something that's not immediate, it's distant. Um, um, can I ask a follow-up question? Because you talked about going to concerts and I play music as well, so I love to go to concerts. Yeah. Does your sense of smell become a little more acute when you are in a loud sort of concert environment? It actually normally goes the other way. That's why really bad restaurants have loud music. When you have a lot of stimulation in your ears, your face and uh, nose actually lo uh, lower their activity. Right? So that you not, if you notice this, if you're trying something new, not a new food, for instance, notice this yourself. If you're trying this, you go, you want, you want quiet, you want to concentrate, and that means lower the nose. It's a well-known trick. If your food sucks, have the music, and then people can't tell. Huh. Yeah. It's a jam. And this concert was in the middle. The last concert I went to was actually this band, the Middle East, a loud French uh, psychedelic rock band, too loud, way too loud. But uh, uh, I smell old beer at these places, which is not my favorite smell. So you have to smell other people or you smell old beer. But damn it, during quarantine, I missed it. I missed <laughs> it. It's not the same to see it on your TV. Uh, and yeah, people do do food symphonies. You know about this, I'm sure. Where you take music, choreograph it to a meal. Even have compositions built for certain meals. I have some friends at Berkeley that played around with it years ago. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's another frontier. What I want to do is have a microphone in the stomach to get the gastric sounds, <laughs> map that to beautiful music. So as you're eating, the natural progression of the food becomes something wonderful, to not just you know gurgling tummy. I may consider that reference for my next mood problem okay. next year. So we have a question from the from the online. Oh, do you have a question? You gonna read it? I'm going to read the from the chat. So. From Lucas Lopez, we have a question. You mentioned that recreating smells was challenging because of contamination in the environment. What is your view of recreating smell perception as, st as stimulating directly the nervous system? Yeah, it's kind of what I talked about. Um, eventually, that's how it's going to be done. 
when you know we, we master all of this. Um, I don't know how many decades in the future this is. Um, we talk about people that lack smell. This could be a way around it too, but of course it requires intervention. Uh, I know little about it. Uh, I don't know how easy it is to wire up to the receptors to wire into the olfaction bulbs or whatever parts of the brain are relevant. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure it's a part of it. People may have even tried it. Uh, you guys in the audience know more than me. But yeah, it, it's, it's obviously something that, that would happen eventually. I just don't know how far it is. What does that process look like? Like, what does that mean exactly? What process you mean wiring to the... Yeah, stimulating well, it directly. I don't know. What does if that look like? If you do it like? to the ear, you can wire up to the cochlea. If you do it to the eyes, you have to go to the retina or the D1 cortex. If you uh, do it for smell, where do you go? I don't really know. Some of you would know better than me. Some of the speakers would probably be able to answer that one better. Uh, I don't know if anybody that's had an olfactory uh, prosthetic. I mean, haven't even heard the term, but it might exist. It's intriguing. Yeah, or like a smell aid kind of thing. Yeah, or like a smell aid. Yeah, yeah, the same. I mean, an amplifier you can maybe do with a wearable uh, somehow, but uh, a uh, yeah, if you get into the nerves, you can do anything. But it's just a technology that emerges again for people that have trouble. Normally, you know, prosthetics where you have paralyzed that's advanced enormously. Will will be breakthroughs happening imminently in that? Uh, And uh, you know, for, for hearing already, it's 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 still got a long ways to go, but it's gone pretty far. And uh, vision we're just starting to see. Smell will come. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, for the next speaker, sorry. Good, so I, I should wrap uh, up here? Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Andres, it was a pleasure. Uh,